Our guest today is Colonel Larry Wilkerson. Colonel Wilkerson served for 31 years in the US Army, starting as a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. Later in his career, he was Chief of Staff to US Secretary of State Colin Powell. Colonel Wilkerson taught at William & Mary College and at George Washington University. In 2020, he was named a non-resident fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a think tank in Washington, DC. Colonel Wilkerson, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. You've had a distinguished career in military and public service centered on identifying and mitigating threats faced by the country. In your opinion, what is the greatest threat facing the United States? Today, it's uh, as easy as it ever was during the Cold War, if, if it was easy during that time. Um, and that is uh, nuclear weapons and climate. Uh, those are the two threats confronting the world that are existential right now. We have abandoned all arms control. Um, we did it primarily. We abandoned the ABM treaty under my administration, as it were, George W. Bush. And then we proceeded to abandon everything else, including Colin Powell's signature achievement, which he often reminded me of under Ronald Reagan when he was deputy and then national security advisor, the INF Treaty, which eliminated, as he would always say ecstatically, an entire class of nuclear weapons, the most dangerous class, as a matter of fact. Um, and we're on the verge of eliminating the last vestige of nuclear arms control, the New START Treaty, which I dare say Vladimir Putin given the language passing between Washington and Moscow right now, will not be uh, willing to renew. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, that's just colossally dangerous. We're back at a time, for example, where I hear general officers, admirals, as I heard uh, read about, I actually heard one or two in the early 50s uh, because I was privy to it. My father was in the military. Uh, they talk about nuclear weapons now, as they did in the early 50s, as battlefield weapons, as having utility on the battlefield. Um, the Russians have actually, as I understand it from the Finns and the Swedes, who monitor it pretty closely, put it in their written doctrine that tactical nuclear weapons have battlefield utility. This is very dangerous. Um, we're back at a time where some would say we're as dangerous uh, with regard to nuclear weapons as the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, or in my estimation, a far more dangerous crisis as most Americans knew very little about, the Berlin Crisis of the same time frame, where we actually watched over the East Germans as they built the Schanmauer, the Wall of Shame, the Berlin Wall. Because we knew if they didn't build that wall, the 10,000 people leaving the GDR every week would soon drain the GDR of any human people. <laughs> so, you know, that was strategic with Russia. Cuba was a gamble. Berlin was strategic, fundamentally strategic for both of us. So I think that was an even more dangerous crisis. And yet I think today we're back in those kinds of times again. I'd like to, you know, you, you mentioned. Um, battlefield tactical nukes, and that's certainly come up in the discussion over Russia and Ukraine. I'd like to turn to that conflict. As you look at the um, the conflict from the build up to the crisis and then the outbreak of kinetic warfare, if you were to issue a report card to the Biden administration for it, for how, on how it's, if you were to issue a report card to the Biden administration on how it's handled the conflict, what would that report card say? I think it would be a D to a D minus with uh, some parenthetical exceptions for the president himself. As a matter of fact, when Biden is Biden, most, most uh, as Powell used to describe him, uh, kind of uh, uh, not necessarily consistent, even ambiguous from time to time, that, those are not necessarily bad qualities for a president. So as, as he has wandered through the ambiguity and the statements that seem like his followers have to retract or modify afterwards, he's actually been pretty cogent, um, saying one thing for Vladimir Putin, another thing for his domestic political audience, and yet another thing for reality. Um, so I credit him with that. I don't credit Tony Blinken at all, Jake Sullivan at all, or anybody else in the diplomatic corps that I've heard talk. They are as bad as Western media, from London to Washington to, 
I shouldn't say Tokyo, though from times Tokyo can get into it, um, warmongering media. I've never seen anything like it. I, I didn't live through, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and William Randolph Hearst and all those good guys. Uh, you find me the war and I'll sell it for you, that sort of thing. Um, but this is terrible what the media is doing. It, it has become, oh, it's white Christians. Oh, my God, they're Ukrainians living in the United States. Oh, this is a war we can love. And it's been that way. And no one's telling the truth. The truth is very much different from what Moscow's media is putting out and what Washington and others' Western media is putting out. It's very different. The reality is significantly different from what both sides are saying. And if you understand that the only way to resolve this crisis, and it should be resolved yesterday, is diplomacy, then that really leaves you wanting a great deal. No one seems to be interested in it. I'd like to drill down a little bit on that. What are the truths that the media in Moscow and Washington are not sharing with the public? The most glaring one is that Russia is not going to lose, period. Russia has strategic depth, 11 time zones, like no other country on earth. Uh, Russia has absorbed invasions in the past. Don't go to Munich, for your example. Uh, go to Napoleon. Go to the Nazis. Um, there's your examples for the staying power of Russia. Even in 1917, when Russia was bruised and battered in World War I and then bruised and battered at home, I wouldn't have wanted to walk into Russia, as some did, the white Russians, for example, Britain and others, even us, and try to fight them. Um, it's just not something you do. So Russia, first, Russia is not going to lose. I don't care what Zelensky does. I don't care what NATO does. Russia is not going to lose. Now, if NATO were to come at her with her full might, then we'd have nuclear war and we'd all lose. So that, you know, that's hardly a victory. It's not even a Pyrrhic victory. We all lose. Um, just a few nuclear weapons we now know. Phys physicists and others have instructed us throughout the Cold War. Explain that to them. Um, got them to back down a little bit, and we began to do some things that, really stunning they hadn't done. For example, we, we introduced them to permissive action locks, which go on your nuclear weapons and keep people from using them inadvertently, <laughs> or at least give you a better chance of that. And we introduced them to escalation control and deterrence theory and all these things that we learned during the Cold War and now have apparently forgotten, by the way, we're dealing with Ukraine and with Putin. Um, so that's part of it is that they're just not pitching the war right. So if it's an endless contest in the heart of Europe with people dying every day, what's your solution? Sit down and talk. Let's stop this stupid conflict. No one's going to win. Zelensky, if we have to drag you kicking and screaming and your wife too to the talks, you can sit in the corner and listen because we're not going to let 40 some odd million Ukrainians bring the world into a Holocaust. That's the simple reality of it. So we got to get this stopped. And I think really good diplomatists like Sergei Lavrov, Wang Yi from China, for example. I don't detect any in America. I wish I did, but I hope there are some. Maybe Biden himself will have to go. But they need to sit down and they need to talk. And some need to eat crow. And some need to admit what reality and truth is on both sides. And then we need to say to ourselves, this is stupid. This is idiotic and it's insanely dangerous. So let's stop. said that there is no way that Russia is going to lose this war. Isn't that assuming that Russia is going to remain fully committed to the war and is willing to commit all its resources? There have been stages of mobilization. Putin still hasn't put the entire country on a war footing. He hasn't leveraged the considerable resources. He hasn't brought those completely to bear on Ukraine. Do you think he is committed to winning it or to at least advancing his interest where to to a degree where they are acceptable is he is he is he fully committed to achieving his goals in Ukraine that's his Ukraine. real concern and when people talk about well why did he let finland with that law the finns would never let us put those things in there i guarantee you they would not i don't care if they are members of nato and i think that'll change i really do i think once this hard winter hits and once we move on through the the circumstances that are going to be generated in this winter, I think we're going to see a really frayed NATO alliance and maybe even a severed transatlantic relationship. 
because it's going to get really grim if we don't stop this thing. That's another reason to stop it. I'm not a big fan of NATO, but I do think it serves a purpose as long as it adheres to that purpose. For example, when we went uh, into talking all the time about out-of-area operations as NATO's raison d'etre. Okay, how does Article 5, the most important provision of that treaty, apply to out-of-area operations? Are you saying if we take NATO to Iraq that we're guaranteeing those forces in Iraq our nuclear umbrella? <laughs> you know, this is insanity what we've done. Uh, but at the same time, I think it does have some resilience. It does have some utility, mostly as a political alliance rather than a military alliance, but it does have some utility. But I'm I'm frightened that it's going to destroy itself over this winter and the months afterwards because of what we've done. And that's what Putin is looking at. I'd like to turn now to China. How would you assess the strategic threat posed by China to the United States? And ever since Carter made it official, President Carter made it official, and Nixon and Kissinger and Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai talked in Beijing and affected a sort of rapprochement between China and the United States. We essentially said, we recognize there's only one China. And they essentially said, we recognize you have a relationship with Taiwan. And we said, okay, as long as you never use force against Taiwan, we will not make Taiwan an independent state in an internationally legal sense. Right. Um, things like that. Now uh, we've got people like Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, my old boss on the policy plan staff of state, saying we should have strategic clarity. Richard, you're a lunatic. It's worked for 40 years. Why would you want to stop until it is effectively not working? Then you might want to stop and have strategic clarity. Um, but strategic clarity is lunacy because we couldn't beat China were China to use military force against Taiwan, ergo nuclear weapons. I mean, you talk about the American people waking up tomorrow morning, you'd have 100,000 casualties in the first 10 weeks. You'd have immediately two carriers on the bottom of the ocean. That's 5,000 men and women each. That's 10,000. My God, Let's say 2,000 of one carrier strike group survived and they're in the water. They're survivors in the water. Think World War II, flames and diesel, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. USS you couldn't pick them up because the escort ships for a carrier today do not have sufficient berth space to take them on board. You'd have, you'd have to have some kind of special vessels going in. You think to China. Take a look at the Chinese fishing fleet sometimes. It's 15 times bigger than the United States Navy. Mm. And most of those boats are armed. This is an incredible flotilla that the Chinese have. And we could never in the South China Sea think that we could beat them, maybe tie them because our technology is better, our missiles are better, our, some things are better. Chinese have pretty damn good torpedoes. And, and very um, good, very good shore to ship missiles, which they've been developing in the last 20 years. Just, Flocks of them in Fujian province alone. Yep. I mean, they could shoot 600 at Taiwan tomorrow morning and not even, you know, over their coffee. Mm. Um, so this is preposterous. Strategic ambiguity is working. We should keep it that way. But people seem to think in the Congress and in the White House that clarity is what is necessary. They're going to wake up one day when all of a sudden they have to do it. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be dangerous. And I suspect we won't do it. I suspect it'll all be rhetoric. Hmm. Uh, I guess we should explain for our listeners who, who are unclear, unfamiliar with the phrase that strategic ambiguity refers to the, the the lack of definitive clarity over whether the U.S. would go to war to defend Taiwan. I'd like to double click on, on one aspect of your answer. You know, on China, are you saying that the United States would likely lose a conflict with China if it went to war over Taiwan? I think if the United States went to war with Russia on exterior lines in Europe, it would lose the first six weeks, surely. They'd it lose badly, and the American people would have to be confronted with 10,000 casualties a day, something they haven't been confronted with in their lifetime. Um, I think in China, it would be very much the same, maybe even worse. And every war game or simulation that I participated in when I was in the military, over 60. When we wound up with that sort of thing years ago, 
when the Chinese didn't have the formidable capabilities that they do today, years ago, when we wound up with that sort of situation, you wound up contemplating the use of nuclear weapons because what you had done is you had taken out their air force, you had taken out their navy, or it had become a fleet in being, which is a military term for they went to port and wouldn't come out. Hmm. Um, and we're looking at mounting an invasion of China. Now, we've taken a lot of attrition in our Air Force and Navy, too. Not quite as badly as the Chinese, but pretty bad. And we're thinking about mounting an invasion of China. Anyone who does that is an idiot. Ever watch The Princess Bride? <laughs> you do not want to put land forces in China. We don't. Have, our army right now is smaller than the army of Bangladesh. And they fell 27,000 recruits short of their recruiting goal this past year. The Navy just announced it would start taking 40-year-olds as recruits. That's how desperate the all-volunteer force is for people today. So, And China doesn't have any problem putting two and a half, three million men and women out. So you'd never invade China. So what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You sit there in the war game and you contemplate using a tactical nuclear weapon on Shanghai or some other city where the Chinese will really notice it. And you think to yourself, they won't shoot back. Well, I, that's crazy. That's crazy. They will shoot back. And why are the Chinese now thinking about and probably going to implement an entirely new nuclear posture? Because they have thought about this and they have said Mao was wrong. Mao Zedong said, I don't like nuclear weapons. I don't want too many. A couple of hundred is all I need just to deter others. Now the Chinese are probably going to break out and build lots of nuclear weapons in all classes, and they want to be able to ride out that first strike and retaliate. So we've made the world that much more dangerous with regard to numbers of nuclear weapons. I'd like to pull back the lens a bit to, to within the United States. In your opinion, what is the greatest threat to democracy in the United States? Americans. No question about it in my mind. I mean, I'm watching the elections right now and have been since last night. Um, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I don't necessarily mean that simply because Democrats seem to be holding their own, but because Republicans are losing. And the Republicans that are losing are the kind of Republicans that should not even been allowed in the race in the first place. <laughs> They're the three out of five candidates, three out of five candidates denied Biden won the 2020 election. Um, this is threatening democracy. And I know there are a number of people out there. I'm a Republican, after all. There are a number of people in my party, as I told a bunch of Democrats not too long ago, who were sitting around talking about how to make free and fair elections that the American people would accept the results of. And so I said, don't just remember, remember that in hotel rooms and corporate lounges and so forth all around this country, my party's sitting down thinking the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's thinking, how can it beat you? How can it illegally beat you if necessary? How can it gerrymander to beat you? How can it get into ADP, ADP systems and close races and buy 50,000 votes here and 50,000 votes there? How can it cheat? How can it win, period, which is all my party cares about? Look at their record over the last 20 years. They haven't accomplished a thing except opposition. And if you get in power, they won't accomplish anything either, as they were previously. They, they, they just oppose. This is a tragic situation because in our system, paltry the sometimes I think it is, we need two parties, two viable political parties. Um, I'd like to see four or five. Two political parties is, is, is minimal, and it's so traditional. I think the American people would have a hard time with a, a, a major change that put more parties out there with viability. Um, you need two healthy ones. And right now we have a sick one. And we have another one that is too bought out by the deep state. And the deep state is not what a lot of people say it is. The deep state is people like Elon Musk and George Soros and Charles Koch and all those other people who have billions and billions of dollars to spend on ruining your country. What is the legacy of the last presidential administration on U.S. foreign policy? It's an interesting question. 
and one that my answer will probably startle some people. Um, I don't think Trump really moved too far from what U.S. foreign policy already was and what U.S. foreign policy had really dramatically morphed into post 9-11. What 9-11 did, what, what the terrorist attacks on uh, the Pentagon in New York, what they did was they put a, a group of people into both the deep state and into actual office in the government who had been around for a long time. I, I call them the Hitlerites in waiting, uh, the, the Jacobins in waiting, the Trotsky, whatever radical term you want to use, because they are radicals. They're not conservatives, they're radicals. It put them in positions of power all across the government and all across the country. And frankly, I suspect there are quite a few of them that would love to have a Fosse estate, uh, at least an authoritarian state. And the names that would come to my lips of some of these people might astonish you. One of them just got reelected governor of Florida, for example. Um, these people frighten me because they don't think democracy works. Uh, they don't think democracy can work. They believe that democracy exercise the way we are exercising it and have exercised it, they would say, since roughly the Earl Warren Supreme Court, for example. Um, does anything but turn into mobocracy, that there are too many people with the vote, there are too many people that have the vote that don't understand what it is to own land and to have property and to be working hard towards being that billionaire and so forth. And so they want everyone to be that way, not too many competitors, mind you, but they want everyone to feel that way and to vote that way, and they see it going the other way completely. What's the legacy of Donald Trump on democracy in the United States? I think he did, I hope not irreparable, but uh, what, what could be irreparable damage. But as I said, I don't think he was uh, the only one that did that. I think he was just the fulfillment of what was happening in the hustings anyway. And it came together at a time when no one suspected it would come together. And so it had a lot of shock power. But he really didn't do a whole lot. Um, he didn't even do what he said he would do, which I found uh, very, uh, I won't say, I have a hard time saying anything favorable about Donald Trump, but when he was talking about the Iraq war, the second Iraq war being a farce and a, a, a mistake and so forth, and telling everyone that he was anti-war, that was before I knew uh, uh, categorically that he told anyone anytime what they wanted to hear. Um, I was actually in favor of it because I saw I wasn't in favor of him enough to go vote for him, but too many other crazy things. But uh, when he said he was anti-war and said the Iraq war was terrible and all this, I said, well, that's something that should be happening. We always have had that kind of wing in the Republican Party, whether it was those who even opposed, uh, well, they opposed World War I rather, rather powerfully, um, Wilson's entry into that war. And then they opposed for a time World War II. After Pearl Harbor, it was pretty much gone. But um, we've always had a wing in the Republican Party that was not foreign adventuring, uh, particularly military foreign adventuring. And it's gone. It's disappeared. Um, and, and that looked like something Trump was trying to bring back. So that was the part of his uh, campaigning, anyway, that appealed to me. I soon learned that uh, he didn't mean anything he said. He said whatever he said for political opportunism. But he created that that MAGA movement that coalesced, what, 75 million Americans um, in this desire that I just spoke of earlier. It's in co in co it in some respects. They don't know what the ones who stand up and talk, like Lauren Boebert, Boebert and others who stand up and talk about Christian nationalism, the ones in the military, who say, yes, we should have a Christian nation, and, and we should be its warriors. We should be soldiers for Christ. Um, he sort of consolidated all those people and showed them that if they worked together, they could elect Herschel Walker in Georgia. Uh, they could get people who would deny an election, even though the election was probably one of the freest and fairest we've had in this land, the 2020 election. I, I know I monitored it from the National uh, uh, Task Force on Election Crises mm -hmm. for two years. 
with some of the most uh, astute political scientists and legal experts in America. It was a very free and fair election. There was very little fraud, very little cheating. And that that did happen was summarily done away with by the states who took their action that they should act. Um, so uh, Trump did that. That's his legacy, I think. He left this dissension and this uh, uh, desire to to secede from the union even in mm -hmm. some respects. He left it very cogent, powerful, intact, and ready to act again with a better leader, a smarter leader. Colonel Wilkerson, I'd like to ask you, what would you like the American public to understand about America's place in the world and how the country should conduct its foreign policy? One of the reasons we're doing Ukraine and backing NATO so strongly is we don't want to lose the hegemony we have over, yes, over 740 million Europeans, including their engine, Germany. Mm -hmm. We don't want to lose that hegemony. We want to solidify it, put it together. Freeze it to death, maybe, in the winter, but nonetheless That's put it right. under our hegemony right. once again. Um, with that as, as as backdrop, I have a real problem with America's foreign policy and security policy today, which is really the foreign and security policy of empire. What would you like the U.S. public to understand about how U.S. foreign policy works and what its goals should be? I think it's imperative that at least the people who vote and the people who are concerned with the future of this country, whether it be as a democratic federal republic or whatever, um, need to know that right now, those wars that have been waged and waged relentlessly since September 11, 2001, and I could trace them back before that with a certain fidelity, um, are waged not for democracy, freedom, peace, all the things that our presidents tell us that they're waged for, um, but they're waged for the deep state and they're waged for the extension and maintenance of empire. Um, some Americans who are a little bit more uh, read into things than others would probably say, particularly in my political party, the Republicans, well, that's the way it should be. We are an empire and we need to manage it. And every now and then we need to bash people who want to stop our managing it or interfere with our managing it. Uh, and they would think that that was OK to say that and OK to say, for example, as I used to to my students, what we're really going to study here, students, is murder for the state. Now, the state's going to call it increasingly uh, or in the past, at least, according to Thomas Aquinas and others, <laughs> Uh, the just war theory is going to say that we're exercising our rights on Article 51 at the UN, in some cases, defense, in other words. It's going to say defense thousands of miles from our own borders, for example. They're going to stretch this thing, the self-defense thing, all the way out there to, oh, Saddam Hussein threatens us. Remember Tony Blair? In 45 minutes, Saddam Hussein could put weapons of mass destruction on London. Uh, what a lie that was. Um, but that's that they stretch these things if they are at all aware of what makes Americans tick and they don't stretch them at all. They just put them out there ball faced right in front of you. If not, it's maintenance of empire. Well, what does that mean? That means Lockheed Martin gets to make trillions of dollars off of these wars. That means that Halliburton, for example, Dick Cheney, CEO of Halliburton before he was vice president of the United States, Halliburton gets to make $44 billion off of Iraq and Afghanistan alone. So that's part of it. You understand why we're going to war. You understand, I tell my students, why we're killing people for the state. Why young people are asked to go in uniform and under arms to kill people for the state is not the preservation of our democracy, not the defense of our way of life, not the defense of our shores, certainly. Your shores, your property, your home. It's to kill people who are opposed to our very predatory form of capitalism extant now all over the world, to include our banking system, our financial system, and everything else. That's what it's for. So if you understand that and you support that, 
more power to you. Keep on going until somebody else builds a coalition against you and destroys you, which is what history argues the world will always do eventually. I want out. I think I'll go to Canada. I think I'll go to New Zealand. I'll do something else other than be here and remain a part of this imperial project, which is going to fall apart. Another thing I would tell my students is, where do you see it engraved in stone that America's empire is forever? What empire in human history, in 5,000 years of human history, what empire has persevered through, through it all? The empire that the sun never set upon, Britain, gone. We replaced it. Um, go back, take any empire you want to take. Take Hitler's empire. Hitler's empire was quite formidable and forged in a very brief time, but it also had a very brief existence. What are we doing with 750 plus bases all over the world, military bases all over the world? The rest of the world together, combined, including Russia and China, only has about 80 overseas bases like we do. Why are we doing that if it's not about also territorial engagement? A new form, Owen Powell used to say to me, we never asked anything for our contributions to world security but a place to bury our troops, like the American cemetery in France, for mm. example. And I would look at him and I would say, be careful, boss. You're stretching history a little bit there, stretching it mightily. We've asked for an enormous return on what we've done. We've asked for predatory capitalism to be prevalent all over the globe. And the Chinese have beat us at that in certain respects today. We taught them. Uh, Israel beats us, beats us at that in certain respects in their little niches. So we're not the only people who do predatory capitalism. They're, they're manifest across the globe. But we do a particularly insidious form of it, which essentially says, you do what we want to do or we'll come in with our military and we'll bash you. And that's actually the phraseology of some of the Republicans who served with me in the Bush administration, the first uh, George W. Bush administration. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I think is imperiling not only us, the empire, but it's imperiling a lot of the world because we are so powerful. We're powerful financially. Look at, look at the sanctions we have now. We are probably sanctioning anywhere from two to three billion people in the world. That's almost half of the world's population. We couldn't unwind those sanctions if we wanted to inside of probably a year, two years, three years. Even if we wanted to take the blockade off Cuba, it would take us forever. How would you assess the state and the strength of the military industrial complex? And what does it mean for the US economy? It doesn't mean as much to the economy as it argues it does, and that people all over the Washington complex of think tanks keep saying it does in terms of jobs and things like that. We know because when Chairman Powell started for George H.W. Bush, his president, essentially delivering, as H.W. called it, the peace dividend to the American people at the end of the Cold War, we found that most of the times we closed that we, we cut 25 percent of the military and we cut a major portion of the defense industrial base, the military contract. Um, we did so thinking in our cerebral moments, oh, my God, we're going to just destroy everything. Well, pretty soon we realized we were making things more efficient, more effective and better rather than destroying things. And we had mayors and governors from all across America who had protested majorly our initial attempt to shut them down, bases, manufacturing capacity, wharfs in Newport, Rhode Island, and so forth. Two or three years later, we're writing us glowing letters about how much better their economy was because of what had flowed into what had previously been a military enterprise space. That's what happened. So the military industrial complex is not as good for the economy as education dollars, as health dollars, as business dollars. It just isn't. That's the first myth. The second one is that it's healthy, other than economically, that you, you, you really want these kinds of things because it makes you more secure and so forth. Well, maybe if they built good products, it would be. Maybe if they built them at a reasonable price, it would be what people say it is with respect to security. But look at the F-35. This is the typical product of the defense industry today. Over cost by billions, doesn't operate the way it was promised to operate. 
most of the fleets of F-35 right now are lucky, lucky if they can get a 50% operational ready time. That means half the time they're broke, broken. Um, so the military industrial complex is much wider spread today too. It's not just Lockheed, Grumman, Boeing and so forth. It's think tanks, it's education institutions like William and Mary who get millions, if not billions of dollars from DOD. It's all the interests that have grown up around the defense complex that find it a very profitable interest for them to be in. And so it's hugely expensive for America. The trillion dollars that we spend now probably close to expected this fiscal year, 1.6 trillion on the national security instrument is just phenomenal when compared with others. It's not the $700, $800 billion defense budget. It's also the intelligence budget. It's the nuclear weapons budget. It's the Veterans Administration budget, which is now $242, $245 billion. Incredible. You understand why DOD broke the VA out and they made it a separate entity now because DOD didn't want to see that price tag attached to its, its budget. It is a drain on the body of America. And it is a drain that makes the rest of the world detest us, or a lot of them. Right now, polls are showing that probably upwards of 3 billion people in the world are not too happy with us. You even go to South Korea, an ally. You go to South Korea and you find polls that people under 35 in particular think the number one threat to their future is the United States of America. That's an ally, South Korea, a solid ally. And their young people are growing up that way, thinking that, you know, we are a threat to their future. In Pakistan, as you might imagine, we actually replaced India as the number one threat in polls in Pakistan, the number one threat to their future. You'll find that in a lot of other countries, too. A lot of countries that might surprise you will, will poll that way, especially their young people. That's part of the legacy of the military industrial complex. Um, why does Saudi Arabia buy 80, 90 billion dollars worth of weaponry that it can't even use 90 percent of the time? And it doesn't have the efficiency, the effectiveness or the troops to use it, but it buys it because, you know, it's, it's the oil deal. You know, they trade us oil for weaponry and they look formidable. Um, and, and yet that creates a bond with a country that probably shouldn't be there, probably should not take place, especially not after. Jamal Khashoggi's murder and some of the other things, the war in Yemen that the Saudis don't seem to want to stop. This is what the military com military industrial complex does to you and the wider array of things associated with it. The private contractors, the private security contractors who are very frightening people in some respects. If you want Trump or someone like Trump to have a Praetorian guard, it is waiting for him in the wings in these people. So it's a dangerous concept, and it's dangerous to allow it to get to the point where it has. Eisenhower's warnings were more, more potent at the beginning of his administration than they were at the end, when he talked about every gun purchased, every fighter plane bought, every ship built, cost this much in wheat, in buildings, in hospitals, mm -hmm. and so forth. And then at the end, of course, he warned the American people flat out. This is a pernicious influence, and it must not be allowed to get out of hand. It has gotten majorly out of hand. Colonel Wilkerson, as we come towards the end of our interview, I wanted to ask you, are there any particular risks that you see in the militarization of U.S. foreign policy, the, um, the increasing use of military assets to accomplish what are ostensibly civilian goals, and also the um, appointment of former military officers or serving military officers into what used to be exclusively civilian occupations in the administration. I think, yeah, I think it's very dangerous, um, particularly the latter point you made. Um, these military officers going out into civilian occupations, like Secretary Austin. I, I don't know Lloyd Austin, but I, I suspect he's an honorable man, but I would never make a uniform military officer Secretary of Defense is a reason why. We weren't doing that. The reason why George Marshall was the only exception um, with regard to um, 
the 10 year, I think it was then, then we attenuated it to seven years, then five years out of the uniform. Now I think you could probably do it and get a waiver from Congress. That's very dangerous, I think, because it brings that military mindset into what should be a civilian mindset, a role that a civilian should fulfill. The, the other aspect of it, the militarization of U.S. foreign policy does something very, very counter to our genuine interests. It dulls the knife of diplomacy. It makes diplomacy second fiddle. Even now, today, it's fourth or fifth fiddle. It doesn't even really exist. We have no diplomatists. What we have is people who make the way for military action. And whether it's Tony Blinken, the ultimate diplomatist, supposedly, he's not shown me an inkling of diplomacy ability. Jake Sullivan has not shown me anything. Wang Yi and Sergei Lavrov, by contrast, are supremely competent diplomatists. And this, this is who these guys are up against. So what do you use? You use the military instrument because your diplomacy doesn't work very well. You don't want it to work well. Then the third thing, the rest of the world, and history screams this at us, the rest of the world tires of this after a while. What is a while? Centuries? Is it decades? What is it? And it bands together, at least its most formidable components, think the other near peer powers. And it gets you. It takes you down. It becomes collectively against you. And in this case, it could be economically and financially that it does this, not necessarily militarily. The Chinese are already hard at work on regional, and I suspect they have global implications for this, currency replacement banking system replacement, financial system replacement. Think SWIFT, for example. They don't like being treated like third and fourth class citizens within our financial network anytime we decide we want to do that, sanctions being the leading instrument we use. So they're working on alternatives. One day, these alternatives will start to grow to the point where they compete and where they even surpass. And that's how you go down. Colonel Wilkerson, Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.